I'm reading from the sixth chapter of Joshua and using verse 20, just a portion of it as a text. You are listening to this broadcast, I read a number of scriptures, but I would like to encourage you to read this entire sixth chapter to get this total story of the first major conflict of God's people going in to possess the land. And as a general theme, I want to use and I want to pick out just four words out of this 20th verse. So, so the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet, and it came to pass. Four words, it came to pass. Now I tell you, I can take them four words and have church with them. It came to pass. Now the first portion of this that I read is God talking to Joshua. And then he recapitulates and goes through the story and tells it exactly how it's going to take place. And there's only one alternative. If God said it, you can put it in the bank. You listening to me? It's got to come to pass. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the Son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? It came to pass. Joshua is the one that succeeded Moses. Now, I'm not trying to take any way, anything away from Moses. Moses was one of the greatest men of God in that Old Testament. He was a redeemer to those people that were held in bondage and in captivity under the whiplash of Pharaoh, and he brought them out from under that terrible tyranny of Pharaoh. And he brought them to the borders of the Promised Land. Now, God never intended for Moses to allow those people to wander in the wilderness. But God intended for them people to go in and possess the land. Hear me, church. I'm getting tired of talking about it. I want to enjoy it. Can you shout amen? Amen. I'm tired of looking over there and seeing all the goodies. I want to get my feet in it. I want to get my hands in it. I want to possess the land. And I believe that God brings us out of sin and out of the degradation of this world for one purpose. Not to cause us to flounder and wander around in a wilderness. But I believe He saved us and He redeemed us to bring us into a land of blessing that He has already prepared and it belongs to you. Now, I made up my mind I'm going to have it. I said, I made up my mind I'm going to have it. Now, we've heard some preachers declare that Canaan is heaven, but it is not heaven. There's sin in Canaan. There ain't going to be no sin in heaven. This promised land is the place where God wants us to dwell, the fullness of God. It's a land of blessing. Every one of you know the story of the twelve spies that were sent out to view out that land. Moses was stopped at Kadesh Barnea. They could see it. But he sent a man out from every tribe of Israel and he said, go out and see if it's a good land. You think God's going to give you something that ain't good? This was nothing but a sheer sign of unbelief that they wanted to go out and check up on God. You don't have to check up on God. All God's looking for is a man or a woman that will take Him at His Word and step out on that Word and say, live or die, sink or swim, I'm going to do what God says and I'm going to lay claim to that promise. Can you shout praise the Lord? But you can't change history. It's there. They sent out a spy from every tribe. And I want you to know, you can't get 12 men to agree on anything. Just ask these pastors around here that have to deal with boards. You can't get 12 people to agree on anything. 
And they went out and spied out that land. Ten of them come back with a bad report. I'm getting sick of bad reports. I want to hear a good report. Two of them come back with a good report. But the good reports were outnumbered by the bad report. All because of what they saw in that land. Now listen. They all saw the same thing. But it's how you tell the story. They all saw the, the same thing, even those with a bad report. They said, it's a good land. It flows with milk and honey. But we're not able to go up and take it. There's giants in the land. All they saw was the enemy. And the enemy was there to keep them from entering in. And they said, we might as well break camp and go back to where we came from. Well, I've already made up my mind. I ain't going back. I come too far to turn around. And I'm going on in. And I'm going to lay claim to every promise that God put in that book. You going with me? Turn around and look at somebody and say, I'm going through. I'm going through. I'm going through. Now let me give you this little history before I get into this message. But here, they came back with that evil report and those ten men turned the hearts of three million plus people. Three million people. But here comes two men and I mean these two men got the goods with them. They brought back a jug of milk a bucket of honey, and they brought back grapes as big as oranges, and they come up the road singing, we are able to go up and take the country, to possess the land of Canaan to the sea. And though the giants may be there, are the way to hinder, but God will give the victory. Hallelujah. That's the watchword. All came to pass. Now, you know the story. The rest is history. God turned them around. But let me say this to you, every one of you people. When you find something in that Word of God, and God makes it real to your heart, don't run off to some theologian and ask him what he thinks about it. He'll turn your mind away from what God spoke to you. He'll tell you it's not for today. But I want you to know the Bible says, let every man and let every devil be a liar. But let God... God be true that if He said it, then He will do it. And if He spoke it, He will bring it to pass. Hallelujah! Now when God gives you a revelation of truth, He wants you to act on that thing immediately. You don't go home and sleep on it. You don't go home and think about this thing. You don't run off to people and ask them what they think. Because you ain't going to get anybody to agree on anything. What do you think God made that real to your heart for? Stand on what God said. Hold your ground and say, I shall not be moved. Hallelujah. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God. If He said it, then I'm going to do it. But you see... All those people were turned by ten men by what they had to say. And there's always people telling you, divine healing is not for everybody. The Holy Ghost is not for today. You a liar, devil. Then God done must have made a mistake. Because I'm talking in tongues. And I'm healed by His stripes. Because I laid claim to that promise. And I made up my mind I'm going to have it. But you see, the next day they had a change of heart. And they said, well, we come this far, we might as well go on. God said, oh no you don't, you ain't going now. You go now and you're going on your own. God said to Moses, turn them around. He says, they'll see it with their eyes, but they're not going to enjoy it. And now we got a new generation. Their carcasses bleached in the sands of the desert. And God raised up the younger generation. And now Joshua is the new commander in chief. And he's about ready to move into the promised land and lay claim to everything that God promised. If your mama don't want it, then you take it. Hallelujah! If your church don't want it, then you take it. It belongs to you. And I'm going to have it. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? I made up my mind I'm going to have God's best. I'm reading from the sixth chapter of the book of Joshua. 
One verse of Scripture from that 20th verse, just a portion of it. It came to pass. It came to pass. If you can find it in the Word, a promise that God declares, there's only one thing that will bring it to pass, and that is, if you believe it. That's the, that's the bottom line. You have to believe. The Bible says, and I know folks don't like me to quote this, but I'm just a newsboy that just landed on your step. Don't you get mad at me for saying this. But the Bible says, He that believeth not is damned already. He that believeth not is damned already. I believe God. That's what makes you different from the world. They don't believe, but you believe. That's the faith of God that you employ. This is the difference from getting healed and staying sick. I believe, therefore I'm well. I believe, I talk in tongues. I believe everything that He has laid down in this book. And if God said it, then I made up my mind, I am going to possess it. Now Joshua had to come to a place... How would you like to be a man to try to succeed Moses? Moses failed to take those people into the promised land. Moses is a type of the law, and the law cannot bring you into the fullness. The law had to die. Moses died. But God raised up a successor, Joshua. And that word Joshua in the Hebrew, we get the word Jesus from. The law can't bring you into your fullness. Jesus is the only one that can bring you into that fullness. Now here Joshua is on the eve. This is their first major campaign. This is their first battle with the devil. Now there's so much involved in this. I wish I had time to talk to you about Rahab the harlot and how she sort of preserved those spies. And that woman was saved when the rest of the people perished. Why? Because God honors only one thing, and that's faith. This is the only thing He honors. He don't care where you were born, what kind of a, a, a situation that you were born in. He only considers one thing, and that's faith. And if you have faith, you'll be the recipient of God's blessing. I want you to go back to that fifth chapter of Joshua, and let me read this to you. In verse 13, it says, It came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and he said unto him, Art thou for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, The man with the sword drawn, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. You see what I'm trying to get to here? Before Joshua attempted to go in and take the land that God promised them, Moses failed. But here on the eve of them going in to take Jericho, the walled city, God Himself comes down. I believe it was Jesus that stood there with a drawn sword. Joshua was standing by, looking over Jericho, possibly commenting on some last-minute strategy on what he was going to do. When all of a sudden he saw this man coming with a sword in his hand. And Joshua, being the great commander that he was, pulled out his sword, sort of sliced the air with it, and headed for him. And he said, Who are you for? Are you for us? Or are you for our enemy? And he said, I ain't for neither one of you. But I come to lead the host. I come from the Lord. Oh, I like this. My God, I like this. Hear me. The battle, God tells us that there is a conflict out there. But the battle is not your battle. The battle is the Lord's battle. 
Don't you turn that radio off now. Just keep it on. This is the reason why many of us are cut down and we get wounded and we get bruised in the conflict and in the warfare because we're trying to do the fighting. I talk to some Christian people and they say, I'm doing all I know how. That's why you're messed up. You ain't supposed to doing what you know how. You have a captain of the Lord's host that has already defeated the devil. You're no match for the devil. Your elder brother Jesus has already destroyed him and put him where he belongs. And that's in a place of defeat. And the battle is no longer yours, but the battle is the Lord's battle. Can you shout praise the Lord? And here on the eve of the conflict, here he is facing the captain of the Lord's host. Now, as I said, I believe this. I don't put this out as doctrine, but I believe it was Jesus that stood there. And he says, what do you want me to do? This is a true mark of a leader. A total surrender. Took his sword and laid it at the feet of that heavenly visitor. And said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, just follow me and I'll do the work. Ah, uh, don't you like that? Hallelujah. Hear me, folks. This is what it's going to take if we're going to be more than a conqueror. We do not blow up our own ego, but we go down a little deeper into the dust and say, Lord, I surrender. I give everything in your hands. All I'm going to do is be a follower. And wherever you lead me, I will follow. And I'll go from faith to faith and from victory to victory and from glory to glory because I have a leader that's going to lead the way. The conflict belongs to God. Hear me, beloved. I believe if every one of us would zero in on this, on every conflict that we go through, and realize this, don't you ever forget it. The battle is not your battle. The battle is the Lord's battle. I'm reading from the sixth chapter of Joshua. The people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. It came to pass. It came to pass. Now listen to me. There is something about faith that we don't hear much about today, and that's the patient kind of faith. And every time I preach this, my wife says, you preach into yourself. And I confess that boldly, even on nationwide radio. Patience. How many of you are just like me? You need patience. I see some of you rolling your eyes. A lot of times, God, and let me say this, God allows us to get into situations where we must learn how to wait. I need that. I like things to happen right away. How many of you like me? Sure you are. We all alike, aren't we? Man, I want the thing now. What's wrong up there, Lord? Well, there ain't nothing wrong up there. Something's wrong on this end, you see. And a lot of times, we need that patient kind of faith. You remember that little woman? That little woman in Scripture beating on that judge's door. That judge was in bed. And he ain't about to get up and he's saying, Go away! Keep on the beating. What you want? It's me, Your Honor. I want a vengeance of my adversary. Office hours are from 9 to 5. Get out of here. Beating on that door. Beating on that, beating on that door. And the judge said, oh, whatever the woman wants, I'm going to give it to her. Just to get rid of her. Though she weary me. And Jesus once told this story. And He said, how much more will your heavenly Father... Those that call on Him, He says, He'll answer them speedily. Ah, but wait a minute. And then without batting an eyelash, He says, When the Son of Man cometh, 
will he find faith on the earth? What kind of faith? Go right back to the woman. The kind of faith that she had, the ability to hold on until that answer gets there. Most of us are too quick to forsake the thing. Well, maybe God don't want me to have it. How many times have you said it? Have you ever said it? I have. You ask God for something, you don't get it and say, Well, maybe He don't want me to have it. Oh, I see the smiles. I know where I'm coming from now. But it's so true. But let me tell you a story in that Old Testament about Daniel. Daniel was one of the greatest prayers that ever lived. Prayed three times a day. He knew his God. And some of the men that hated Daniel infringed on his religious convictions and persuaded the king to introduce a law that says... But you should not ask a petition of anybody but the king. If you do, you're going to die. Is that right? And you know the story, how they threw him in the den of lions. And I mean, they haven't eaten in a week. But when Daniel was thrown in there, he just used their manes for a pillow and went to sleep. He knew how to pray. But there's one time, now hear me. How many of you ever prayed and got an answer quick? Let me see your hand. Sure, sometimes you need that. But how many of you ever prayed and the answer didn't get there? Some of you are saying, it still ain't here, preach. (laughs) Well, hang in there now. I'm ready to help you now. And Daniel was the same way. Daniel prayed and asked God for something and the petition never arrived. And so finally Daniel said, Lord, something wrong. Now I know there ain't nothing wrong there. Now check this out. Ain't nothing wrong here, but there's something wrong. Lord, I'm not going to eat until that answer gets here. That's dedication. One day went by, a week went by. No food, no answer. Two weeks went by, no answer. Twenty days went by. He's laying out now. And on the 21st day, here comes an angel. And you know what the angel said? Get ready to shout. He said, Daniel, 21 days ago, the Lord heard your prayer. And 21 days ago, the Lord sent me with your answer. Daniel laying there saying, man, what took you so long? He must have gone by the way of China. And you know what that angel said? That angel said, Daniel, when God sent me with your angel, the demon spirits that are scattered around this nation was in combat with me, and they wouldn't let me through with the answer. But God saw I was having problems, so He sent another angel down and got in the fight with me, and I slid through to give you the answer. That's what I'm trying to tell you, Mama. Don't give up! My God, hang in there! Walk around the wall! Keep on walking! He said, ask, keep on asking. Knock, keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. Everyone that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened unto him. I'm getting ready to blow the trumpet around here. And I'm waiting for a shout. Shout! God said, when you shout, I'm going to deliver the city into your hand. Raise your hands toward heaven and shout. I said, shout. I said, shout. I am reading from the 21st chapter of Joshua, the last phrase of this entire chapter. I believe that I will use it as a text. I put italics in my Bible and underlined it. The last four words, all came to pass. Everything that God had promised to Israel, it has just come to pass. God.
God cannot lie. The first thing we have learned when we study the Bible is that God is immutable, which means that it's impossible for Him to tell a lie. If He said it, He'll do it. And if He spoke it, He'll bring it to pass. However, God may have promised healing to you, but you may not be enjoying the healing. Because I have found something here in this particular scripture reading. Back in verse 43, The Lord gave unto Israel all the land which He swore to give unto their fathers. Are you listening to me? God did not swear this unto this people, but God made the promise to their fathers. But their fathers never entered in and possessed their inheritance. Their carcasses are bleached in the sands of the deserts and they died without entering in to the fullness of God. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that if you do not enter in and lay claim to the promise of God, somebody else will claim it and they will be blessed. I'm not here to argue with you whether or not this is real or whether it's not. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If God said it, I'm going to stand on it and put my name on it and claim the promise for myself. I believe the Word and I shall not be denied. Can you shout praise the Lord, somebody? God made the promise to the fathers of these people. But they failed to enter in. And it says here in this 43rd verse, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land. All of it. Now, I want to spiritualize this thing a little bit. I don't want to keep you back in the Old Testament. I want to bring you over into the New Testament realm. Are you enjoying all the land that God has provided for you through His Son Jesus Christ on Mount Calvary 2,000 years ago? Some people in the church, you hear them testify, I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved. They've been testifying that same testimony for the last 20 years. They haven't gotten any further than salvation. Thank God you're saved, but there's a little more that God has prepared for you. And He's waiting for you to stretch out on His promise and move out a little further and get some additional help that He has prepared for you. Can you shout praise the Lord? Salvation! Do you have all the land? Some people are content to make heaven their home on the skin of their teeth. Some of you don't have no skin on your teeth. Let me go a little further. Some of you ain't got no teeth. Well, I just don't want to sneak in. Some Christians are singing the song, Lord, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. I don't want no cabin. I don't even want no motel room. I'm sick of them things. I don't even want no trailer house. But it took Jesus 2,000 years to prepare something for me, and I can't wait to get there and make it in to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Can you shout praise the Lord, somebody? They're content just to get saved. But there's some people that says, I just don't want handouts. I want everything that God's promised for me. And if you're willing to pay the price, you can go a little further and you can claim the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. Can you shout praise the Lord? Some Christians never heard of the word sanctified. Most of the church is crankified. But God said He would sanctify us. You know what sanctify means? To separate from the world. And to set yourself apart for the work of God. It has three parts to it. And I could spend all night on this. 
to be separated from the world, to be set apart for the work of God, and to be filled with the Spirit. This is sanctification. Are you listening to me? Sanctification is instantaneous. Sanctification is progressive. It will continue every day. But the another word for sanctification, and I like to use this word, it's called holiness. Everybody shout, holy. This is the message of the hour. I know that we're living in the time of miracles and God is doing great things, but preachers need to declare the message of holiness today to come out from the world and be separated and touch not the unclean thing. And God said, then I will hear your cry. Can you shout praise the Lord, somebody? Separated from the world. Now, I don't mind telling this on, on, on radio. My wife been traveling with me now all this year. All our kids are all grown up now. And she goes with me. And I'll never forget out in California, a young woman approached me. She said, Brother Shamba, can I talk to you and your wife? A beautiful young girl. And after the service, we talked to her and she said, Brother Shamba, I played in the Hollywood production called Hello Hollywood. She said, I'm a singer. She said, I've been listening to you on radio. And she said, the Holy Ghost has been getting a hold of me. And I've been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And she says, God has been calling me out of that mess in Hollywood. But she said, a lot of my, I'm going to use her words, a lot of my charismatic friends have been telling me that I can be used of God in that, in that world, the element that I'm in. That to stay right there. But she said, I can't listen to my friends. The Holy Ghost told me to come out from it. I said, what are you telling me this for? She said, well, I'm asking you what, whether you think I made the right decision. I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Because God already told you what to do. He told you what to do right here in the Word of God. I didn't come here to whitewash this thing, but I come to tell you that the Word of God is true. Let every man be a liar. Let every devil be a liar. But let God be true. And He said, come out from the world and you have done the right thing. And she says, now I use my voice only to sing the songs of Zion and to give God praise with it. I said, thank God you haven't been influenced by any church group. But you have been influenced only by the leading of the Holy Ghost. This is what the Bible means when it says, When the Spirit of truth shall come, He shall lead you and guide you into all truth. And you'll have no man to, that's able to teach you. The Holy Ghost will lead you in the right path. Because He'll stick by the Word. And He'll bring you out into holiness. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? All came to pass. He gave them all the land that He sware to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it. And they dwelt therein. Do you have all the land? I've made up my mind I'm going to have it. Everybody shout, yes! Let me read it to you. The last phrase in chapter 21 of Joshua. All came to pass. Going back to verse 43 again. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which He sware to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it. And they dwelt therein. I don't know whether I'm going to get any further than this tonight. Everything that God promised them, they had it. They possessed it. Salvation, sanctification. I'm bringing you over into the New Testament now. I'm going to bring it up to date. It's not enough just to be holy, but God has some added blessings and benefits that belong to you and you can only have them as you lay claim to them. Remember it again. God promised this to their fathers, but they never enjoyed it. Some of your parents never had the experience
experience you have had from God. They were church members, but they were told the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not for today. And there's a worldwide move on right now to discredit anybody that talks in other tongues. Getting quiet now. This is a promise that God has given unto every one of you because God said in the last day, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. You say, well, I'm saved and that's enough. Another group will say, I'm saved and sanctified and that's enough. Go a little further and get filled with the Holy Ghost and get the Spirit of God upon you and then you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Jesus said, then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. Did he say so? Take another step further and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe God opened this up to my heart when we were in Houston not long ago. And I get a little upset at preachers when they start denying the Holy Ghost. I do. I get upset with them. I, I must confess it. I shouldn't, but I do. Because they have not tasted of this experience. And a lot of them condemn it. Now hear me, some of you preachers, don't you turn that radio off. I know you're listening to me. If you don't know anything about it, don't condemn it. If you never talked in tongues, man, don't condemn it. And there's a lot of preachers that are fighting the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the speaking in other tongues as the evidence of it. They're even fighting it on television and on radio and they're fighting it in their magazines. Because I've read it. I've got it written from their own hand. I know what they're saying. Well, I got converted. I don't fight with them no more. I don't get mad with them no more. So what happened? I got saved. Down in Houston, Texas, a white-haired Baptist preacher come walking down the center aisle and he said, Give me that microphone, preacher. I want to testify. The Spirit of God said, Give it to him. He said, I am a Baptist preacher. And he said, I've been fighting the Holy Ghost for the last 20 years. I've been telling my people it ain't real, there's nothing to it, it's not for today. And he said, I've been fighting God for 20 years, and God just knocked me down with his little fingernail. Flip. And he said, he knocked me down in my pulpit, and there I was laying on the floor, and when I got up, I got up talking in another language, and now I'm a Holy Ghost Baptist preacher. Woo! I never got so blessed in all my life. And I could start naming names right now, but I ain't going to do it. But all I'm going to do is tell you, you preachers that are fighting this Holy Ghost, watch out. Because the same God that knocked him down with his little finger, the same God is going to knock you down, and he's going to have you talking in tongues in your own pulpit, and all your people are going to know that you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, and this thing is real in this last day that we're living. Can you shout hallelujah? Oh, yes, he will. So when I hear preachers fighting it now, I smile and I say, sick of Sick of law. I'm not going to get beside myself no more. I'm just going to go ahead and shout anyhow. You can criticize it all you want to. You go ahead and fight it. You don't know who you're fighting against. But my Bible says in the last day, God said He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. That means Baptist flesh. That means Methodist flesh. That means Lutheran flesh. That means Presbyterian flesh. Roman Catholic flesh. Jehovah's Witness flesh. Seventh-day Adventist flesh. Old dead Pentecostal flesh. Upon your daughters in the Handmaiden, he said, I will pour out my spirit in that day. Shout, yeah, somebody. Oh, hallelujah. 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 
The promise is there. Possess it. It says, they possessed it. Hear me now. Some of you Pentecostal people, some of you were born in Pentecost. And you don't even know what it is. You believe in it, but you don't possess it. But I want you to know this thing is real. It's not enough just to believe in this thing. You've got to possess this thing. If you believe in divine healing, then get well and stay well. If you believe in salvation, get saved and stay saved. If you believe in sanctification, then get sanctified and stay sanctified. And live holy until Jesus comes. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord somebody? Hallelujah! They possessed it. Divine healing. It's the church today that's suffering. God's got more trouble with His own kids than He does the world. The people in the church, they say, Well, I know God's a healer. And when He gets ready, one of these days He's going to come by and heal me. You old hypocrite. God healed you 1,900 years ago. The Bible said, Who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. We are healed. We are healed. Healing is the children's bread. Enter into the land. Possess all of it. God cannot lie. If he said it, he'll do it. And if he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. Hallelujah. (laughs) I can't finish this in one minute. They possessed it, and they dwelt therein. I like that. Most Christians just come for a visit. Get a little taste of it and run back out again. They come to church and say, thank the Lord I'm saved. They're saved in church, but when they get out of church, you can't tell them from the devil's crowd. It's my last night, I told you, I'm going to hit you and run now. It's not enough to possess it, you've got to live there. You gotta build your tent there. I'm talking about getting saved in the church. Stay saved in the home. Stay saved on the job. Stay saved when you're walking the street. Stay sanctified when you're out walking the street. Stay sanctified when you're out on the job. Live there. Don't come back to the healing line and get hands laid on you every week. Get healed and live there. I am healed. I am well. I claim the promise. It belongs to me. It's mine. And I lay claim to the promise. Raise your hands and shout hallelujah, somebody. Ooh, I feel this thing all over me tonight. Turn around and get somebody by a hand saying, The devil's a liar. I ain't going to be sick no more. I'm healed by his stripes. The 21st chapter of Joshua. Last verse. The last four words. All came to pass. That blesses me. That's why I love to read the Word. Most preachers will stand up behind the pulpit and tell you what you can have. And what you can't have. This is not for today. This is not for today. And when you find out what's not for today, there ain't nothing left. My Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Man's the one that does the changing, but God never changes. Can you shout amen, somebody? Let me move into that next verse. Verse 44 says, And the Lord gave them rest. Lord, I can show you some of that. I can hear you talking now. The Bible says there remaineth a rest. For who? For the people of God. The Lord gave them rest. I could spend a whole week on this. Some of you people listening to me on radio and some of you in my audience tonight cannot go to bed at night without taking a tranquilizer. Sleep ease. Hallelujah. 
Say amen now. No rest. Somebody said to me, Brother Shambach, how do you sleep? I said, as soon as my head hits the pillow, I am off in dreamland. Because the Bible said, He giveth His beloved sleep. We're one of the beloved ones. That's what you are, beloved. John said, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And you shall praise the Lord. Rest. We're living in a pill age. You want to make money fast? Go in the pill business. All kind of pills. Pills to go to sleep. Pills to wake up. Pills to keep you awake on the job. Uppers and downers. You all getting quiet on me now? Pills for nervous disorders. It hits you right here. Nervous frustrations. Some of you aren't sick. You need to get your rest. All i got to do is lay hands on you in the name of Jesus and command peace to come to your nervous center and it will come just like that. Jesus said, Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord gave them rest round about according to all that He swear unto their fathers. The promise wasn't even to them. It was to their fathers. They failed to enter in. But thank God we come under the promise. That's the reason why I love to read the book. To find out what God said belongs to me. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? Fear. I have never seen so much fear in all my life. Such as is evidenced as in the church today. Believers. With a tormenting spirit of fear. Some people are afraid to go out at night. Because they say the streets aren't fit to walk on. Just depends who you go out with. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know about you, but every time I go out, I go out with Him. Don't you? And the angels of God encamp around about them that fear Him. If you're going to be fearful, fear Him. Fear has gripped the church. Some people are afraid to fly. There's only one fear I can think of today that's legitimate, and that's fear of driving an automobile. When you get out on the highway with them alcoholics and drunkards, Lord, you better have Jesus in that car with you. Come on, shout amen, somebody. The Bible says He hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. Fear is a spirit, and yet the church is being tormented with this spirit. I didn't say you're possessed. You cannot be possessed. This is a tormenting spirit. It's an outside force that attacks the nervous center and he comes by putting thoughts in your mind. Fear. When you get on the plane, something will say, what if that engine stops? And you say, yeah. Or, you feel a pain on the right on the left side around the fifth rib and ah! not only do you feel the pain but you hear a voice saying heart trouble and you say yeah how many of you know what I'm talking about or you feel a pain in the lower part of your back and you go ah! and you hear a voice Arthur come for a visit Arthur, arthritis. Yeah, they said he'd come when I get 45. That 
That's when you were in the world. You are now a child of God. God said, I'll bless you going in. I'll bless you coming out. I'll bless your basket. I'll bless your store. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in the country. Everything you set your hands to, I will bless it. If you'll walk in my ways and keep my commandments. Can you raise your right hand and shout hallelujah, somebody? God gave them rest. Hallelujah. Beloved, you can be living in a hornet's nest. You can have alcoholics on one side of you, drug addicts on the other, harlots below you, root workers spreading all kind of junk on your doorstep. And you can come out smelling like a rose every day. <laughs> Woo! Somebody says, pray that I'll move. Uh-uh, let's move the devil. You're a child of God. And God said everything that you set your feet on, He's going to bless it. Can you shout praise the Lord, somebody? I had a lady come to me some years ago and she said, pray. Brother Sam, I pray and ask God to give me an apartment. So I prayed for her, and she come back again. She said, ask God to give me an apartment. I said, hey, didn't I pray for you, woman? She said, yeah, but I moved 29 times this month. I said, 29 times? That's a record. She said, I want to move again. She said, Lord, I thought I got out of one hornet's nest, but I got into another. She said, there's sprinkling powder all over my doorstep. I got root workers all around me. She said, pray that I move. I said, no, you ain't wasting my prayers, woman. You ain't wearing me out. I said, do you like the apartment where you're living? She said, oh, I love it. I said, then let's stay there. She said, what about the root workers? I said, if anybody's going to move, the devil's crowd's going to move. God's children been moving too much. If we're going to get somebody to move, it's going to be the devil that's going to move. Because God said, if two of us here on earth agree as touching anything, it shall be done. He said, whatever I bind on earth, he'll bind it in heaven. And whatever I loose on earth, he's going to loose it in heaven. We're going to put the devil where he belongs. That's right under your feet. He got no business on your leg. Got no business on your back. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Raise your hand and shout hallelujah somebody all came to pass the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he swear unto their fathers and there stood not a man of all their enemies before them the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand would you like to have that rest tonight come to Jesus as you are and he'll give you peace Raise your hands and shout, praise the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah! Chapter 21 of Joshua. I'm still in it. All came to pass. Everything that God said, He did it. People will tell you, God is not a healer. The devil's a liar. I said, the devil's a liar. I didn't call that person a liar that says God don't heal. They're right. When somebody tells you God's not a healer, they are right. He's not a healer for them. They don't believe the promise. But we believe the promise. Don't argue with them. Just stay well. There'll be people that tell you that salvation is not real. Don't argue with them. It's not real for them. But God hath chosen you. And God hath chosen me. And it's real to us because we believe the promise. There'll be church folks that argue with you and, and they'll say the Holy Ghost is not for today. Don't argue with them. Smile and say, you right. But I got it and I'm full of the Holy Ghost. It's not for today for you, but it's for today for me. And while you argue, I'm talking in tongues. Shout praise the Lord, somebody. This is what I'm talking about. 
all came to pass. What if some do not believe? Does it make the Word of God of none effect? God forbid! If God said it, he'll, He's got to stand by it. Oh, I've preached this many times on radio. You remember God sent an angel, not just an ordinary angel, one of the biggies, Michael. And he sent him down to the temple where Zacharias was burning incense. A holy man, a just man, an honest man. He was married to the woman whose name was Elizabeth. You know the story? They've been praying for a child and she was barren. And in the old age of this man, God sent Gabriel on a special delivery Western Union telegram. He stood right in the midst of him. Did you ever wonder? The first words an angel always says is, Fear not! You know why he says that, don't you? Because when he's doing his business and he sees the end, ah! The angel says, Fear not! And if you ever get visited by an angel, you're going to make an exit to a wall somewhere. The angel always says, Fear not! Calls him by his name and says, Fear not, Zacharias. I just came from the presence of the Lord. Man, that's all he'd have to say, and I'd have church with him right there. I believe I'd grab his hand, we'd go dancing around that church. Just came from the Father. I'd sit him down and say, Man, tell me what the Father said. Let me know about it, will you? The angel said, Zacharias, the Lord has heard your prayer. And your wife Elizabeth's going to have a child. He looks at the angel and says, huh? Oh, he says, we've been praying for that for 30 years. You're too late now. You missed the wrong house. You're talking about the Zacharias lives down the street. He's just a young man. We just married him. Isn't that just like church folks? You pastors know what I'm talking about. You go pray for somebody and say, God's going to heal you. You say, oh, you don't know what my doctor said. I don't care what your doctor said. I come to tell you what my doctor said. Your doctor says you're going to die and not live. But my doctor says you're going to live and not die. Come on, shout amen, somebody. My doctor says the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. The angel said, The Lord heard your prayer, Zacharias. And He sent me on a special mission to tell you you're going to have a child. Oh, Gabriel, man, you made this trip for nothing, man. Look at me. I'm an old man. And you ain't seen Lizzie lately either, have you? You see what I mean? Talking himself out of the miracle. You know what Gabriel did? He shut him up. Made him dumb. He said, I ain't going to argue with you. He said, you're going to be dumb for nine months. You hear me, boy? The whole time she's carrying that baby, you ain't going to be able to say a word. Struck him dumb. What would happen to us preachers if God would strike us dumb? Lord, we wouldn't be able to preach. That might be a good thing, huh? Couldn't say a word. And he said to him, The first words that come out of your mouth will be this. His name shall be John. Talking about John the Baptist. God preserved Elizabeth's body so that John the Baptist could be born. But he couldn't believe it. You see what I'm getting at, beloved? All came to pass. Now, I don't want to go into this because I'll get beside myself. But this is the thought. I was troubled over this verse many years until God opened it to me. I said, why did God answer his prayer when the man couldn't even believe? He doubted. Now, that ought to encourage every one of you. Because some of you are sitting here don't know whether you're going to get it or not. You've tried everything else. You say, well, I might as well try this old loudmouth preacher. Maybe I might get something here. 
Even in your doubt, God will heal you. Oh, what are you saying, preacher? Us preachers say, if you only believe, God's going to give it to you. I'm going to say it the other way around. I don't care whether you believe or not. God's still going to do it. Somebody says, I ain't got no faith. I do. I don't care whether you ain't got a lick of it. I got it. My Bible says the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. The one that does the praying. I got the faith that God's going to do it tonight. And God's going to give you your miracle. How can you say that? I'll tell you how I can say it. I asked God this question. I said, how come Zacharias got John the Baptist as his son when he couldn't even believe it? God spoke to my heart and he said, the moment Gabriel spoke it out. The moment he spoke it out. God said, I couldn't take my word back. Because when I say something, I've got to do it. That's what I've been preaching about these last four days. All came to pass. I don't care what your church believes. I don't care what your preacher says about it. If it's in the Word of God, circle it. Put a star there. Stand on it. Say, devil, you're a liar. If God said it, He's going to do it. And if He spoke it, He's going to bring it to pass. Everything is coming to pass because God is not a man that He should lie. Oh, hallelujah. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. Even though he didn't believe it. But here you are tonight. You've got something working for you. You believe the Word. You're standing on that Word. God's got to bring it to pass. When He says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, He means what He says. He said, in the last day I'll pour out My Spirit upon all flesh. I don't care who you are. Tonight's your night to receive the Holy Ghost. I don't believe it. I don't care whether you believe it or not. You're going to go out of here talking in tongues anyhow. God knows how to make a believer out of you. Can you shout amen to somebody? You that have the Holy Ghost, you're going to go out of here? Well, you may have to be carried out. Because I'm going to ask God to give you a double portion of His Spirit. And I'm going to pray He gets you drunk on the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? All came to pass. All came to pass. If He said it, He'll do it. If He spoke it, He's going to bring it to pass. Tonight's my night. Tonight's my night for a miracle. Hallelujah. Can you say the same thing? Tonight's my night. Stand to your feet, everybody. A little while ago, you told somebody, I believe you're going to get a miracle tonight, didn't you? Turn around to that same person and say, "Uh Uh-uh, tonight's my night. Chapter 4, and I'm just going to use one phrase from the 11th verse. Only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Five little words. The man of God, one of the greatest apostles that ever lived, I believe, is coming down to his greatest valedictory of faith on the verge of being massacred for the gospel's gospel's sake. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And I have kept the faith. Nobody endured suffering like this man outside of Jesus Christ. But Paul bore in his body the marks of Christ. Everything that Paul lived was Christ. Everything he preached was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But in his final words here, I have pulled out four particular names of people that Paul came across. And I believe that he is leaving a reminder to every one of us as believers 
not to pattern our life after individuals. Not even Paul. That's the problem with mankind today. We always want somebody to follow. We're looking for a man to follow. And if you follow a man, you may end up like the folks did in Guyana who followed Jim Jones. Some folks are following a church. But if you want to follow somebody, then let me point you to Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, even while he was baptizing some of his disciples in one of his greatest meetings, stopped baptizing when he saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the Bible says some of John's disciples left him and followed Jesus. I like that kind of preacher. He followed Jesus. If you want to follow somebody, follow Jesus. But there's four particular people, four names of men, and I want to just preach to you a little bit. You that are listening to the broadcast, it'll take me four days to finish it. But you who are under the tent, you'll get it all tonight. First of all, the first name you will find in verse 10, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Paul is awaiting his execution, and Demas, a man that associated himself with this great apostle, this evangelist went with him possibly on a missionary journey. He started out in a blaze of glory. But now he is departed. He hath forsaken me. And many of you here tonight know some Demases around. Oh, they started out testifying what God did for them. But it seems like that they didn't hang in there. And you're the ones that I'm preaching to tonight. I call Demas the victimized person. He has become victimized because he got his eye on the glitter. He was captivated by the world. He did not have a deep-rooted committal. But when he was in Rome where Paul was, and all he could see was the man that he was following was in prison. And he wanted to see the lights of Rome. Rome was symbolic of playboys in that day. But the playboys of today will be the playboys of tomorrow. Can you shout amen? He became victimized by the world. Just like a lot of church folks that I know that live so close to the world. They have one foot in the world and another foot in church. They live in the world Monday through Saturday. And then on Sunday they're in the church singing a new song. But God is looking for a people who will not be victimized by the world. But he said, come out from the world and be separated and touch not the unclean thing. And then I will receive you unto myself. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? A prisoner. It's dangerous to be a Demas. He lost his consecration. He lost it. A man who was associated possibly with the greatest preacher that ever lived. He had a future that was secured. He could have been an Elisha. He worked right alongside of Paul. Thank God for an Elisha. When it was his time to go, Elijah said, what do you want, man? One request if you see me taken away. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Hallelujah. Here's a man that burned his bridges behind him. Here's a man who forsake every, forsook everything. He had a deep consecration. And when it was time for Elijah to go, Elisha got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. 
God has put you in that place where you are and he's looking for a deep rooted commitment. Jesus himself said when the sower goes forth to sow seed some of it falls by the wayside. Some falls among thorns. Some falls on the rocks. But he said some falls on good ground. Oh hallelujah. It seems like that Demas is the one that receives the word of God among thorns and he lives so close to the world that he was concerned about worldly things and it choked out the spiritual life that he had and he's lying on an ash heap tonight because he did not have a deep rooted commitment to Jesus Christ oh I'm preaching to Christians tonight some of you may be here that have never accepted Christ as your Savior. I'll get to you a little later on. But I'm talking to Christians tonight. Some of you that are playing church and have one foot in the church and the other foot in the world. It's time to come out from that world, beloved. We're living in the final hour. Jesus is coming back for a church without a spot and without a wrinkle. He's coming back for a church that is holy without a blemish. Can you shout it? Amen. My God, it's time to get ready and it's time to stay ready. Do not be victimized by the things of the world. Do not be a Demas. The cry of this great man of God was, Only Luke is with me. When it comes down to the nitty gritty, ah, oh, Paul didn't write this thing from the back seat of a Cadillac convertible. But he wrote this from prison. You can't talk like this in some Pentecostal circles today. But the time's coming when you're going to have to declare your commitment to Christ. Are you listening to me? Some of you here that are listening to the sound of my voice. We're living in the age when we're going to have to seal our testimony with our own blood. We are in warfare. The devil is out to destroy the church. I don't care whether or not you're a Demas and whether you're living close to the world. There's still a change. There's still a chance rather. There's still a time for you to come back. There's a time for you to get involved. There's a time for you to get a complete commitment to Christ where you will forsake the world and come all out for God and ask Him to fill you with the power of the Holy Ghost and be committed to Him that you want to be one of these members in this last day where He's going to channel His power through the body, the church in signs and wonders and miracles that's going to usher in Jesus Christ. I want to be one that He's going to use and I made up my mind I'm going to have it. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me somebody. Only Luke is with me. I made up my mind I'm going to be a Luke. Can you shout praise the Lord. I'm reading from the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. Verse number 11. Only Luke is with me. And those words kind of stood out. And I began to study this. On my prior broadcast, I mentioned a man's name by the name of Demas, the victimized individual. A man who received the word and it fell among thorns. And he forsook him. Demas hath forsaken me, captivated by the glitter and the attractions of the world. Couldn't pay the price of being a prisoner. And in this verse, verse 11, only Luke is with me, but the very next phrase says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Mark number two. Mark is mentioned in the same verse. Only Luke is with me, but take Mark and bring him with you because he's profitable. You who are Bible students remember the time when Paul would not allow Mark to go with him. Because Mark was a type of, of a Christian or a member of 
that's always vacillating. He was a type of an individual. He was a Christian that starts out right. But he easily gets discouraged. Woo! Don't turn the radio off. Did you ever get discouraged? If you can't holler amen, holler ouch. I call this the vacillating Christian. Easily discouraged. But thank God all hope is not gone when you get discouraged. Everybody under this tent has been discouraged at one time or another. If you haven't been discouraged, you're dead and don't even know it. We have all had an apple out of this bag. But thank God discouragement didn't take us under. Can you shout amen with me somebody? He lost and wavered in his consecration. But finally he reconsecrates his life. It got to him when he was discouraged. Some of you are possibly going through discouragement right now saying, Why do I have to go through all this? Put yourself in David's shoes. God anointed him to be king over Israel, but Saul wouldn't get off the throne. God anoints you with the Holy Ghost and fire, and you're running from the devil. Woohoo! Don't get mad now. Discouragement. God called me to be the king. And here he is running from the king. The king's backslidden. And he ain't about to give up the throne. And the only throne David has is a cave. And the only subjects he has are men who are on the lamb from the law. Fugitives from justice. Men who aren't paying their alimony support. I'm bringing it down home now. Are you listening to me? People that are in debt. These are the only people that David is ruling over and the only throne he has is a cave and he's on the run from Saul. Oh yes, discouragement is part of it. But God's not through with you yet. Are you listening to me? Some of you are going through some trouble right now. Your back is against the wall. Some of you are down to your last dollar. What am I going to do? The next time the offering is taken, put the ten dollars in if that's all you got. Get rid of it. Now God's got to start working because you are down to nothing. And that's where God likes to start working. Come on, shout amen somebody. Some of you have already received the doctor's report. You have three months to live. There is no more hope. And you got discouraged. You've prayed. You have men of God pray for you. Every time a man of God comes to town, you get in the prayer line. You got a prayer cloth on this side from one preacher. A prayer cloth on that side from another ministry. You got one in your pocket. You got one in your purse. You got one stuck in your shoes. You got a bottle of blessed oil. You got a four-leaf clover. Come on, shout amen with me somebody. You're discouraged. My God, is there really a God somewhere? You're beginning to doubt and you're getting discouraged. The man of God is in prison. They're going to cut his head off. Is there really a God somewhere? And I've come to tell you to hang in there. Help is on the way. The devil may have you knocked down, but you're not out yet. It's time to take the mandatory eight count. Recoup your strength and get back into the battle. God didn't call you to become the victim. He called you to be the victor. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Can you shout amen? 
mind. God never intended for you to be the vacillating Christian. My God, He wants you to have power over the devil. And it's time to get back into the battle. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Oh, listen to me. Every one of us have gone through that. I've been, you know, not far from here. I was arrested right here in Texas for preaching the gospel. I wasn't arrested for stealing. I wasn't arrested for beating my wife. But I was arrested for preaching the gospel. Some of you heard about that. Right down in far Texas. The mayor came out to the meeting. I thought he was going to give me the key to the city. I shook his hand. I said, am I glad to see you? Oh, come on and say, greet the folks. Say hello to them. He said, this ain't no social call. You're going to jail, man. I said, huh? He said, I don't believe in what you're doing. This is my town and you're taking this tent down and leaving. I said, hold it, mister. This town belongs to my father. And my father sent me here to preach. And I'm going to preach. They arrested me four nights in a row. But I want you to know God got glory out of it. They put me on the front page of the paper and put me on eyewitness news. And they brought the crowd out. Couldn't a, We couldn't accommodate all the people. And a thousand people got saved every night because the devil started messing. When the devil starts messing, God starts blessing. It's time for you to get your head up. Get it high. Get that chin off of your chest. It's time to hold your head high. And let the world know you're a child of God. And you are not victimized by any devil. But you've got more power than he has. Because you have Christ. Can you shout yes? Oh, you get discouraged. Say, Lord, why do I have to put up with all this mess? It ain't over yet. I said, it ain't over yet. Go ahead and question. We all do that. But don't give up. I said, don't give up. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It doesn't say of the backslider. It doesn't say of the sinner. But many are the afflictions of the righteous. And if you're going through afflictions, it means you're one of the righteous ones. My God, listen. Listen to the end of it. But, but, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Deliverance is the name of the game. God doesn't want you in the mess. God wants to set you free. And it's time to be set free. Raise your hands and shout with me, somebody. Hallelujah. Reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Listen. Only Luke is with me. Talked about Demas. The victimized member talked about Mark, the vacillating member, a member of the body of the Christ. And every one of us knew what Mark was. He never did get to finish it. Mark came back. He said, he's profitable to me. Oh, I love that about Paul. He might have had it out with him at one time, but bring him with you. He's profitable to me for the ministry. I don't care how many times you fail. The 23rd Psalm is still in there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. For he restoreth my soul. Brother Hamby said we're living in the hour of restoration. I believe that. This is a time of restoration. I don't care how many times you tried and how many times you failed. Now it's time to be restored. God is restoring the church to its original power that she had 2,000 years ago. And I want you to know this church is going out in a blaze of God's glory. Jesus said upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. What rock? That thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Oh, hallelujah. Cheer up, church. We're on the winning side. I said, we're on the winning side. We're not defeated. We 
we've just been beaten, that's all. You've just been brutalized. We've been knocked down, but we haven't been forsaken. Hallelujah! The church is coming back, and we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Now, there's one man in here I don't even want to talk about. But you've got to talk about this rascal, because there's always a lot of these rascals hanging around. Hanging around a tent. Hanging around a church. Look at verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith. He did me much evil. That old devil. There's always an Alexander around, isn't there? Alexander did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. I want you to turn over the first Timothy. I, I found something in that second or the first chapter. Verse twenty, the last verse of the first chapter of First Timothy, and I found Alexander's name again, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Wow. Alexander? Who's he? Alexander. I call him the venomous person. The victimized individual. The vacillating individual. And now the venomous individual. The snake. He never really had a change in his heart or in his nature. Alexander the coppersmith. But he was ordained by the devil to sneak in to pervert the gospel and to challenge everything the man of God sets out to do. Getting quiet on me now. You were shouting with me on the other two. But I want you to hear this because Paul says, Beware of him also. He knew that we were going to be reading this 2,000 years later. And you can have a footprint of the devil of what he did 2,000 years ago, and he never changes, he never does anything new, but it's always the same old mess. And he's still creeping into the church unawares and undetected. Oh, he can dance like the rest of you. Shake like the rest of you. Ma -ma 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 -ma, like the rest of you. Come on now. Shout amen, somebody. Paul looked on this man as a devil because he turned him over to the devil. He poisoned the minds of the people against Paul. You know what I read? And I read this in one of my books. That I read it in a history book. That it was this man who secretly... Hulked Nero into executing Paul. Think about this. Secretly behind his back in the church, he smiles at you and says, God bless you, brother. But he's got a knife in your back. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about preachers and pastors and evangelists, but I'm talking about church folks. You folks that are filled with the Holy Ghost, I want you to know that devil is out to destroy you. We are in a conflict. We are in warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and wicked spirits in high places. I want you to know that people who will give their bodies to the Holy Ghost, there are people who give their bodies to the demon forces. Are you listening to me? The devil will use anybody who will offer themselves to him. Oh, yes, he will. And the devil is out to destroy everything.
every child of God that he can. But you know it's a dangerous thing to fight against God and God's people. It's a dangerous thing to fight against the man of God that stands behind the pulpit. Oh, yes, it is. I said it's a dangerous thing because this is the anointing of God that stands behind the pulpit. In Psalm 105, verse 15, says, Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Oh, way back in the book of Numbers, you will find where Aaron and Miriam opposed Moses when they got jealous of him. They said, we got the same thing. He's God. Who does he think he is? They start talking about him because he was marrying a certain woman, and they didn't like it. Better keep your nose out of other people's business. Don't you all get mad at me now. Are you listening? What happened? You know what happened? Miriam was stricken with leprosy. And had to come back and ask Moses, her own sister, I mean his own sister, talked about her own brother, and this is what's going on in the church. It's a dangerous thing. Jesus said, if you're going to touch one of my little ones, it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck and into the sea than to bother and to hurt one of my little ones. Oh, hallelujah. There's another side to this picture. I don't care how many devils come out against you. You're a child of God. This is not your warfare. You don't have to fight the people. This is not your battle. This is God's battle. He said one of you shall chase a thousand. Two of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And according to those odds, of you can move a hundred thousand and four of you can chase a million. You're on the winning side. My God, there's no devil that can touch your life because Paul said your life is hid with Christ in God and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Can you shout amen? Wish I had time to finish this one, but read the 16th chapter of Numbers. And you'll find where Korah and Dathan and Abiram with 250 people were consumed by the earth because they tried to usurp authority over Moses. Are you listening to me? I would rather yield myself to the Holy Ghost than yield myself to the devil. Can you raise your hands and shout amen? Oh, hallelujah. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. And now I get to the last point. Only Luke is with me. Only Luke. Thank God for Luke. I said, thank God for the Luke. Only Luke hung it out. Hung in there. Why is it the one that sticks by has the most going for him? Here he is, a doctor. His future is secure. Got a name in the community. But he made up his mind. I'm forsaking it all. And I'm going to follow Jesus. Wherever you go, I go. Only Luke. It's not the victimized man. It's not the vacillating man. It's not the venomous man. Ready for the last one? This is the victorious man. <laughs> Victory! Only Luke is with me. And he represents that faithful man and woman where God put him. Are you listening to me? In God's army, there's no captains and lieutenants. They but one leader, and that's the Holy Ghost. 
We're all sons of God. And God fits us into the body where He sees fit. Are you listening to me? And here is a man who is faithful in what God called him to do. And no matter where Paul is, he might have been an intellectual and a physician in his day. He could have been anything he wanted to be. But he didn't compromise. And I like this about that man. No compromise. He stood with the man of God. God is looking for men and women who will not be ashamed to take a stand with truth today. You know, there's some Christians that you don't know what they believe because they don't know what they believe. They're for everything. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And God's looking for men and women today who will take a stand to be a Christian. And I'm talking to you tonight. You that are here that have never made a decision for Christ, I don't care. I don't care what you have done in your past. Somebody says, well, let me get cleaned up. Let me come back late. God wants you just like you are. Come just as you are and he'll pick you up. He'll cleanse you with his blood. Take a stony heart out of you. Put in a heart of flesh. Clothe you with his righteousness. Write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And then he'll call you son. And he won't put you on probation. But he accepts you just like you are. Are you listening to me? Only Luke, because I made up my mind. I've started with Jesus, and I'm going through with him. I said, I'm going through with him. I don't care what a lot of people are talking about or falling away today. I said, talk about it all you want to, but there's a revival in the air today. Hallelujah. I'm in the middle of a revival. God is reviving the church. Sinners are being saved. People are being filled with the Holy Ghost. Miracles of healing are taking place. God is looking for men and women who will be faithful to the Word of God and will not compromise with the world and stand on their testimony in this hour. I'm not ashamed to be called a man of God. Are you listening to me? I was talking to a man not long ago. He says, uh, how do you like to be called, reverend or doctor? I said, just man of God, that's all. Well, he said, I'm uncomfortable with that term. I said, I am comfortable with it. I am a man of God. I love that term, don't you? Thank God for the man of God. I'm God's man. That's what it means. I'm God's man. Didn't come to talk about him, but I come to talk for him. Hallelujah. The pulpit is speaking out today that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did yesterday, he's doing today. He does not change. We're not serving a dead Christ. He's alive. They put him on the cross, but he came off of it. They put him in the grave, but he came out of it. Jesus lives on the inside of me, and he's the same today as he was 2,000 years ago. And he is looking for men and women today. He's calling for an army of believers. And he wants you only for one purpose. And that's a channel. He wants to channel his power through you. He's looking for somebody to use like the devil is looking for folks to use. Are you listening to me? This is what God's looking for. The devil knows that his time is short. And he'll use anybody that will give themselves to him. And I want you to know, God knows time is short. And God's going to use everybody that wants to be used. Are you listening? I'm not talking about you church, church folks that are playing church. Don't you look at me like that now. Maybe I shouldn't talk like this on the first night. 
But you've been playing church for so long you wouldn't know what to do. God, listen, you've been playing church for so long, God has to go out into the highways and He's getting a hold of the drug addicts and He's getting a hold of the alcoholics. He's getting a hold of the harlots and He's saving them and filling them with the Holy Ghost and He's putting power in their life and they're going out healing the sick and casting out devils while you are still playing church. Tonight I'm going to offer myself to Him. Here am I, Lord. Use me. I'm not going to follow a man. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm not going to follow a church. I'm going to follow Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. He's the one that started me on the journey. And He's the one that's going to see me through it. Only Luke is with me. I want to be that one. You want to be a channel of His power? I said, do you want to be a channel of His power? I have seen and heard more testimonies of miracles over this ramp. We have testimonies every night. We'll be starting that soon. Of people that have received miracles not because a preacher laid hands on them. Every once in a while I say, you mean an evangelist didn't pray for you? Oh, no. My mama laid hands on me. My sister laid hands on me. My brother laid hands on me. Oh, my friend on the job laid hands on me during lunch hour. What? You mean you didn't get it in a tent? Uh-uh. You didn't get it in church? Uh-uh. Got it on the job. Oh, I love this. Got it on the job. I'm talking about something that will keep you on the job. You don't meet God just in church or under a tent somewhere, but He goes with you out in the highways, out on the sidewalk. He's with you in your home. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the age. God is looking for people who will be uncompromising in this last hour so that when He speaks, that He's got an ear open that will be obedient to His voice. We're living in the hour when the Holy Ghost is going to lead you and direct you in what you are to do. And I want to have this ear open so that I can be an obedient servant. Can you raise your hand and shout, Amen?